Greetings to everybody. I'm Jeffrey Sachs. Uh, welcome to Book Club with Jeffrey Sachs. And I could not be more thrilled uh, and honored to be speaking today with uh, Dr. Roxanne Dunbar Ortiz, uh, who's just published uh, another fantastic book. Uh, she is a, a world leading historian. Uh, and we're talking about her new book uh, out just this week not a nation of immigrants, uh, big capital, not. Uh, so this is a book uh, uh, calling on us to rethink, reconceptualize American history, because certainly when uh, I was growing up uh, in the 1960s, and she explains why uh, it was in that period, I was told uh, all the time as I was growing up that we're a nation of immigrants. Uh, and uh, that seemed uh, somewhat natural to me uh, because I myself uh, come from a family uh, that uh, came uh, from Eastern Europe uh, at the end of the 19th century and early in the 20th century. So I thought that was uh, what America was. Uh, and uh, this remarkable book, Roxanne, uh, really calls for a a fundamental rethink uh, of America, uh, that America is not a nation of immigrants, uh, as you'll describe and we'll talk about. It's a nation of settlers or settler colonialism, uh, as, as you describe it, uh, and that this is a, uh, a very different perspective. And uh, by the time one finishes the book, and I hope by the time we finish the hour, uh, it also uh, becomes clear that this is not only a matter of getting history right, it's a, a matter of understanding our immediate presence, even uh, the crisis in Afghanistan, I would say, because it's a matter of America's role in the world uh, as reflected uh, in America's role on the North American continent. So welcome. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you for being here. You know, I love your writing and love your books. And uh, this one uh, is, is spectacular. Can you talk about, uh, uh, for everybody just joining in, most uh, who will run out and uh, get your book afterwards, uh, what is the theme and uh, why are we not in the United States, a nation of immigrants, even if we're constantly told that we are? Well, thank you, Jeff, so much for having me on your, your wonderful podcast. Um, yes, the, the theme is really about uh, what the United States really is, a settler colonial state founded as such um, from the initial uh, settlements in Jamestown and, um, and Plymouth. Uh, that was the intention. It was kind of an extension of British um, Settler colonialism in uh, Ulster in Ireland, you know, colonizing Ireland. Uh, so it was not um, a first time. They were very seasoned uh, settler colonialists who who came and uh, took land from the existing people, pushed them to the peripheries. But that doesn't mean there aren't immigrants. There certainly are immigrants, but immigrant settler colonialists come to uh, steal, steal land, take land, move people out and take that land themselves and settle it. Immigrants come to an already existing polity, an already existing society. They had nothing to do with creating it. They're either fleeing, they're refugees fleeing like the Irish famine refugees in the 1840s, you could say they were the first immigrants. That's when immigration started, although they were refugees and there is a, a difference. Um, they, they were being pushed rather than choosing, you know, choose, making a choice. Um, so settlers um, have already set everything up. And of course it's hundreds of years it's been set up. So generations of other settlers came after the, they kept coming, but they were still building what it was, those 13 
colonies. And then they immediately upon independence started moving, you know, the British were keeping them from moving um, over the mountain chain. So they were hugging the uh, Atlantic coast and they immediately started annexing and taking more land and needing more settlers. So up until the 1840s, everyone who came, came for land. They came for land, except of course, enslaved Africans who were brought to do the work of that land. In part, the colonialism of the era um, was mostly around mining and taking uh, resources in, you know, in India, Mexico, Spanish colonialism. But for the British, it was um, agricultural production, uh, particularly cotton and, uh, uh, and tobacco. Uh, tobacco was, um, uh, was indigenous to North America. It was a, a, sac a sacrament for the native people, highly addictive. So it spread all, you know, all over Europe and was a major commodity. So these plantations that get formed and are worked by slave labor, uh, they deplete the land. So they have to get more land. You know, they, they move away from Virginia into, and of course, into the Mississippi Valley. So the, you know, up until 1860, that was the process of settler colonialism. So the first immigration act uh, to exist at all, the United States, the Irish came, the Irish, uh, they were problematic to the existing order. They were Catholics, they were a Protestant country, uh, but they, they found a way of Americanizing by um, affiliating with uh, the Democrats, uh, the party of Andrew Jackson, the very racist party. They worked as, uh, they worked in slave patrols and they worked in um, um, policing, you know, the police were getting started at the time. So there was a certain Americanization, but the first immigration act was actually exclusion, exclusion of Chinese in 1870. That was the, that was the first immigration act. Yeah, exclusion. That's, that's interesting. So it, could and I just <laughs> go back for one moment just to check the basic facts and, and uh, to help people uh, conceptualize the dates. The, the English uh, start coming uh, in the early 17th century, in the early 1600s. Uh, the first settlements, uh, as you said, in, in Virginia, in Jamestown, and in uh, Massachusetts, uh, in Plymouth. And it's uh, in the 17th century that these are settlers because, as you say, they're coming for land. Uh, they are coming for agriculture. Uh, and people should remember that uh, it was uh, only uh, 150 years after that. That's when uh, the, uh, the colonies uh, broke away from Britain and they broke away, as you mentioned in passing, so that they could get more land. Uh, <clears throat> that the American Revolution was uh, really because the British uh, uh, authorities in London were telling the settlers, uh, the British settlers uh, in uh, the colonies don't cross the Appalachian Mountains to the west, uh, but they said, why not? Uh, we want more land uh, and uh, broke free from the British control. And then uh, as you describe uh, in, in the book, uh, it's the Northwest Territory, so-called the Ohio Valley uh, to the west of Appalachia that uh, the settlers uh, first move. Then you mentioned Andrew Jackson of the 1830s. Uh, we'll come back to him in a moment. He is, uh, in my view, uh, one of the uh, racist criminals, presidents of the United States. We've had a few, uh, but uh, he is involved in more land expansion and pushing uh, Native Americans to the West. But then you mentioned in the 1840s, what you're calling, and I think it's eye-opening uh, and I hope people are catching this important nuance. Uh, 
Roman Catholic Irish refugees from famine and from British imperialism in Ireland come to the Americas, but they're really the first immigrants coming to an established political system as workers. And they end up working in the army and in the police to enforce this settler system uh, is as you're describing it. Well, two groups that you, one, you haven't, uh, you mentioned in quick passing, uh, but of course it's a central theme of America and that is the slave, uh, slaves brought by millions to the Americas by the British. Uh, and the fact that uh, when the settlers came, it wasn't an empty country. Uh, you haven't mentioned yet the indigenous population. So I'd like to ask you about that, uh, just to get us get the picture filled out. Yes, it, it's very important to understand that the mythology of um, uh, the wandering um, Indian out in the woods uh, hunting, uh, not, uh, not cultivating the land, which was a Puritan argument that they were actually sinful because they were not cultivating the land. But in fact, they were cultivating the land. The eastern part of um, North America, what is now the United States, was one of the seven um, sites of the founding of agrarian civilizations like the Nile and Euphrates and the Po River and the um, uh, uh, Mesoamerica and the uh, Inca. There, there are seven that are designated in the Eastern, um, Eastern North America up to the subarctic all the way to the Gulf and from the Atlantic coast to the Mississippi River. So this was had been uh, curated by these agrarian native nations. Uh, you know their names, Cherokee, Choctaw, Chickasaw, uh, Seminole and Creek, Muscogee people, and then many others, but those were the very large populations uh, in the Southeast. So they, what the settlers did, they came to already cultivated land and appropriated it. The forests were curated. They burned the underbrush so that uh, they made roads to the forest. That, that John, as um, uh, John, John Smith, the mercenary John Smith um, wrote that he could, uh, he could take a, um, uh, a, a buggy, you know, horses and a buggy, all the way from Virginia to Massachusetts through the woods on the roads that were built and how that meant a, a large army could easily use these roads to conquer the people. So generally people feel very sorry for native people, but they think they were kind of half naked, you know, kind of, uh, going out and hunting and eating. They all lived in villages. It was a continent of villages, basically. And um, they were self-subsistent, but they also did trade, but they didn't raise commercial crops. Tobacco was a wild, uh, they, they did nurture it. It was a, a, but it was a sacred, you know, it wasn't for massive use at all as it became. Uh, the cotton was indigenous. They used cotton for clothing and so forth. So I think this was, you know, to understand that it was colonialism appropriates what already exists. They don't come into a wilderness. There was no wilderness in North America. It didn't exist. That's an invention. Yes. <laughs> well, one, one thing, Roxanne, that amazed me this year because I hadn't... Uh, ever focused on it. I think when I read John Locke uh, as a student almost 50 years ago, we hail the philosopher John Locke who wrote uh, around 1690, the second treatise on government. And in uh, Locke's writings in 1690, he talks about the uh, right of private property and he imagines private property coming from uh, a 
a person who works uh, uninhabited land uh, and uh, makes it his own by adding his labor to it, uh, then he says, well, in the Americas, they use the land so badly that it is our right uh, to take it because if we increase the production from the land, it's not really like we're taking anything away from civilization. It's making a net gift to civilization. It's an extraordinary justification yep. of colonialism by this hero of liberalism. Right. Yeah, and it's completely made up because he had never even seen anything. The, uh, up in the French colonized territory, they were amazed that the Haudenosaunee, you know, the, um, the corn that they raised and they had, they created silos, you know, the silo came from, uh, for storage and the women were all in charge, you know, the distribution of food. They found tons and tons, uh, they said they burned tons and tons of, um, of stored corn uh, that they used through the winter. So it, sh it showed this not only um, that they were very productive, but they were before capitalism, which John Locke was a major contributor uh, to the, for the ideological formation of, there, there was no such thing as, as private property, the land itself being um, a commodity to sell. And I think there's a relationship between uh, the founding of private property as, a, as a, a something that could be bought and sold and the enslavement of human bodies that could be bought and sold because the land is, is sacred just as a human body is. And once you, you know, and it came together with the founding of capitalism uh, in the looting of the Americas. Um, well, it's interesting really because it links the enclosure movements in England, which took <laughs> customary <laughs> land away and made it, it into right. private gentry with the settler idea of taking native land away and making it into private exactly. ownership. Yeah, I had and never women made, were, made that link. Yeah, and women were so important there too, you know, with the commons in, uh, in Europe and Britain uh, maintaining the commons. And they were, that's the burning of the witches, you know, the burning of the women who took care of the land. That was one way to, uh, in Europe. Yeah, Europe really, it preceded and it was repeated then in the Americans and basically taking of the native commons in the Americas. Roxanne, your book opens with a, a real myth buster, which oh, was a little sad for me because uh, it did uh, break some myths that I <laughs> held. Um, and uh, that is the first chapter is about Alexander Hamilton, one of the <laughs> wonderful Broadway plays of, of recent years. Uh, but the, I'd like you to describe this context, but let me just uh, set the stage as it were a little bit, which is that uh, the, the richest British colonies uh, in the uh, 18th century, I think it's right to say were in the Caribbean, the sugar colonies, which were yeah. all slave colonies uh, and uh, actually quite, of course, very ruthless slave colonies and very profitable for uh, the uh, British slave owners and the sugar uh, magnates. Uh, and out of that milieu comes Alexander Hamilton, but not in the way that I thought. So could you actually describe this? Because it is setting the scene for what we don't understand properly about American history. Yeah, US historians, you know, make up a lot of things about these so-called founders. Um, and uh, Chernoff, uh, you know, who wrote the uh, uh, Hamilton biography that uh, that uh, Lin Manuel Miranda created the uh, musical from, uh, he just tell, told lies. You know, <laughs> that the idea that Alexander Hamilton was an immigrant. This is a nation of immigrants uh, 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 extravaganza. You know the. Alex, I never thought I would see 
I was already, already on to the nation of immigrants thing. Uh, from 2005, I wrote a, a kind of a rant about stop calling this a nation of immigrants and you know, giving my thesis. But that play came along and I had, this is the, this is the embodiment of that concept, you know, and making Alexander Hamilton into an immigrant when he was a British citizen, you know, they were a tiny minority in the Caribbean, whether they were French or British or anything else, because these were, these were total slave colonies, the sugar colonies. This is this commodity of sugar. Everyone in the world got addicted to it just like tobacco um, and, and opium, <laughs> you know, the, these drugs that built the Western civilization. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> and, and so Alexander Hamilton- hey, if, you you know, make yes, money going, if, if you wanna make money go into a business of addiction, uh, <laughs> you exactly. have your ready customers yes. there. Right, exactly. Um, so he was, he was white, that meant he was, privileged. He was a British citizen. And uh, although his, his parents died, he, uh, he was taken care of, you know, he was actually um, trained, uh, taken as a, as a, um, uh, we would call it an intern now, you know, an apprentice, apprentice um, in accounting. And what, what were the books about? What was being traded? Slaves. That was the only commodity slaves and sugar. Everyone was involved in the slave trade. So the idea was an abolitionist, an immigrant. Uh, it's just, you know, absolutely ridiculous. He was sent by these, these wealthy uh, men uh, to Columbia University uh, in the British colony of New York to go to college. He was not an immigrant. He could, they could move around anywhere they wanted. They didn't have to have papers or anything else to move within the British Empire. Could he was a subject of the British Empire. From, yeah, from and that, was a, that, that was totally privileged. You know, that was a very privileged thing. So he was already uh, well-to-do. He immediately married into the wealthiest family in New York, the Shilers, who are also the biggest slave owners and slave traders in in the North, in New York. As, uh, as you mentioned, kept... that's the you know wonderful scenes on the play, but they don't mention that the Shilers uh, are are sla a, a major slaver family. They don't mention slaves at all, and they don't have characters that are slaves. I mean, it's this the whole thing is this um, really. Um, uh, the poet uh, Ishmael Reed here in the Bay Area uh, made a play of where he's talking to Lim Manuel about his fantasies. You know, it's a wonderful one act play um, that he put on in New York. Toni Morrison was still alive and sponsored it. And um, so, he, you know, he, he, um, he exposed a lot, but I think the other uh, really, kind of tragic thing about Lin-Manuel uh, Miranda is he calls himself an immigrant. And he comes from Puerto Rico, which is a colony of the United States. So this fuzziness about who's a colonized person, who's a settler, who's an immigrant just gets, you know, wiped out. And that's, that's what the American story loves is the new level of homogenization, so we don't have to deal with all of these, you know, really complicated contradictions. <laughs> and and uh, you you note that Hamilton was opposed to real immigrants coming to the United States. Oh, he was terrified, especially of the French revolutionaries. You know the. Um, the French Revolution, France, the monarchy supported the U.S. the revolution, and then uh, uh, and then the French Revolution started. And and by the time they were, you know, writing the Constitution, uh, he was for the most rigid alien and sedition acts, um, and to particularly to keep French, you know, any French people out. Uh, he was the main spokesman for 
everyone having to be vetted, each and every person. But I think the other thing about Hamilton that people don't understand is he was first and foremost a military man. He was second only to George Washington in the command of the army. He's the one that led 15,000 troops uh, to put down the Whiskey Rebellion. That was Alexander Hamilton that did that. George Washington was involved and then he had second thoughts and went away. It was completely Alexander Hamilton's thing of crushing these uh, peasants over this tax, you know, on their whiskey they were, they were making. Um, they protested the tax and they were being taxed, you know, for, to pay for the military. Uh, so he's basically a military man and he was the most important person in writing the constitution in the actual, well, the Federalists were uh, Madison, but it was mainly Alexander Hamilton. He was a brilliant, I would say he was a brilliant, evil genius. And what, what now, there's a, a lot of literature that has um, looked at the Constitution and come up with this, this term that's really borrowed from uh, 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 the, the development of, the, of, the, uh, of Britain, you know, the British state is a, a fiscal military state. That is a, a state made for war. And I think that's really important to understand that the United States has never seen a day in its existence from the time of the revolution without war. There's a, you can't find a day when there wasn't war, aggressive war, not defensive war, aggressive war. What, what uh, struck so, me, Roxanne, about that, uh, I've thought about that fact how militarized our society is and uh, how British that fact is because probably one could say there was hardly a day without war for Britain from maybe around 1400 uh, onward and then Britain just rolled across the whole world there's a famous map, which I like, the 23 countries of the world that Britain never invaded <laughs> because British troops, <laughs> have been, British troops have been uh, in uh, roughly 170 countries of the world uh, right. during this period. But the US is a British settlement and it created exactly. a fiscal military state because the US then had war as its central a theme to create the territorial United States to dispossess the Native uh, American villages and nations across the country. But I had not made the connection with Hamilton. I think of Hamilton as, you know, yes, creating a central government, creating right. the basis for industry and infrastructure for manufacturing, but also creating the institutions to enable an ongoing military campaign, as it were, which uh, yeah. continues around the world, of course. He also created the first corporation during uh, the fighting, the 10 year war. And uh, it was for, for manufacturing armaments, the Springfield Armory in, um, in uh, Massachusetts. It still exists. That's where you know all the guns are made. So, you know, we're a nation of gun manufacturing too. It's survived offshore. None of them have ever moved offshore, um, and it's a major export from you know, especially the war machinery, but small arms as well. The United States exports sixty percent of the world's small arms around the world you know so and domestically even more what, so what it's a, a very it, martial nation you know we don't people don't think of themselves in the united states as a military a military state and that's dangerous one of the uh, many remarkable quotations you have in here is the statement by Thomas Jefferson, who, who ironically was uh, Hamilton's uh, foe. But in 1801, Jefferson uh, says the following, um, 
However, our present interests may restrain us within our limits, it is impossible not to look forward to distant times when our rapid multiplication will expand itself beyond those limits and cover the whole northern, if not the southern continent, with the people speaking the same language governed in similar form by similar laws. So 1801 and the very birth of the country, uh, I thought it came later, but Jefferson is already saying, we're going to spread out across the entire North American continent and the entire South American continent for that matter. Right. Uh, fortunately, there were no people there, right? <laughs> right. Yeah, and he put it into action, you know? He sent, um, he sent uh, uh, military spies into what was then Spanish held um, uh, Northern Mexico. Um, and uh, he, he sent um, to explore, you know, and explore how, how to make war. And then the Monroe Doctrine in 1821, uh, and then Texas, uh, Texas taking, uh, taking the, the province of Texas, the slave owners taking, uh, taking Texas. And, you know, Mexico was independent and declared uh, uh, abolished slavery, so never accepted Texas uh, so-called republic, yep. but then uh, the war that took half of Mexico. So definitely they were in the, uh, I think, you know, just, just their main competitor and why I think they weren't able to take all of Latin America and the Caribbean was a British competitor, <laughs> the British uh, capital was also very important in controlling. But that mm -hmm. more or less, they handed over, you know, with the Monroe Doctrine kind of handed over um, to the United States. Okay, that's your sphere of interest now. You know, they Can just hung on to a few colonies. Oh, the US uh, conceives itself as a country of law. Uh, and somehow under that law comes all of this uh, war, genocide, expropriation, enslavement. And one of the features of the law, which you have written about uh, beautifully and talk about in this book, is this doctrine of discovery uh, and, uh, and even the Supreme Court validating that. Could you describe that? Because it's really fascinating what comes under yeah. the, quote, rule of law. Yeah, most people, I think, in the United States have no idea that one of the fundamental laws in the United States is based on a papal bull from 1493, uh, which gave um, the Americas to Spain, you know, to Castile and Aragon uh, after Columbus's voyage. Uh, that, uh, that had been preceded by a papal bull um, that gave Portugal all of Africa. So that was the beginning of the transatlantic slave trade. So that doctrine of discovery then was adopted by other countries, you know, even if they, even Protestant England and, you know, all colonial powers started invoking it. And in the United States, it was- What, what did it say um, exactly? I mean, from the context, uh, say, of uh, Protestant Britain, what is the doctrine of discovery exactly that you have the right well, to do? You have the right of possession if you discover it, uh, discover um, another territory without that is terra nullis. And terra nullis is, uh, what that means is that the humans that are there are not considered uh, people who have the knowledge of, of land, even though they're farmers throughout the Americas, they're, they're farmers, you know, <laughs> throughout Africa, they're farmers and herders, you know, they're fishermen, uh, they're human beings uh, living quite well, actually, and um, living longer than Europeans because they take baths. And when Europeans didn't, uh, so that that disappearance of any people who were not Christian. See, it's a Christian doctrine. So 
if they're not Christian, they're not human. And you can take their land or you take their land and then Christianize them. And then maybe they can be uh, for the Spanish, you know, worked into, uh, uh, absorbed, but they're not in charge. So the way the US adopted it, Thomas Jefferson actually um, stated, it wasn't law, but he stated that uh, that it's just built into the Constitution of the United States and the reality that um, that the doctrine of discovery applies to the United States, that they possess it by the right of discovery. And then it was in the Marshall decisions um, about the in church. The Supreme, in, in the Supreme Court, no less. In the Supreme Court, yes. Yeah. So it entered into law. In the Supreme Court. It was most recently validated by the Supreme Court in 2007 in a no. land case of, yeah, in a land case of the um, Oneida, um, you know, part of the Haudenosaunee. It was a clear cut case of really, a very clear cut case of Oneida land uh, that should have been restored to them. And it was a um, it was a Scalia court, but it was a unanimous decision to deny that, based specifically on the doctrine of discovery, naming it. And you know who wrote that opinion? Ruth Bader Ginsburg. No. Yes. Wow. wow. Based on Marshall's precedent, in a way. Yes, and based on the doctrine of discovery being a uh, law. And what she was saying, and you know, it's really kind of scary, is that all of native claimed land in North America then is could be taken away. It's a it's a horrible precedent. You know, if anyone wanted to use it, um, it's you know it, it, it's extraordinary, Roxanne. Uh, uh, one of the very deep reflections, you know, we have come to know much better uh, that uh, an, an original sin of the United States, a profound and deep one, is enslavement. Uh, and, uh, and for that reason, uh, the Dred Scott case uh, in 1857, uh, which said that uh, a slave could not be a citizen of the United States but was just chattel and that this was obvious uh, is so incredibly shocking. And of course it was one of the steps on the way to the civil war itself. But uh, your book is all on the theme that there are really two interrelated original sins. Uh, even the other might be more fundamental. Uh, and that is uh, the uh, the colonial settler taking uh, what doesn't belong to you uh, by dispossessing or committing genocide against uh, native uh, populations, native peoples who were here before. Uh, and uh, there's a great line, I think it's quoting my colleague uh, uh, Mahmoud Mandani, uh, saying that uh, American history is to some extent being deracialized, but not yet decolonized. Uh, so that there's uh, one part is uh, being faced, uh, although with all of the incredible turmoil around that, but the colonial part is not being understood. And I just reflect that while we know the Dred Scott decision, I, I kind of knew about the doctrine of discovery, but still I was shocked uh, to read the Marshall opinion. Uh, and I didn't know what you uh, just said about uh, the Ruth Bader Ginsburg for a unanimous court renewing it. So this part of history is still not, and this is of course the theme of your book, uh, which is that uh, maybe we're coming to grips with some dimensions uh, of what really happened, but we're not coming to grips with this other absolutely fundamental reality, which is that this was a place conquered nonstop relentlessly from other people. 
Uh, and that is a very, very different vision of what, what our history is. Yeah, it's, um, it's also that the two are really inseparable. They're, they're wrapped together, the enslavement of Africans and slave labor and uh, the land being taken. You know, historically, you can't really separate those. That's why almost every history book text that's written um, is, is um, very partial history and therefore distorted. Um, I, uh, the wonderful historian, um, Eric Foner, who's done so much good work on abolitionism and slavery, I mean, just the monumental work, which I, I treasure, um, has never been able to put, put these two, I don't think he's really tried. Um, I'll together. ask him about that because Rox Roxanne, we're going to, I'm going to be speaking with him about his new book, uh, The Second Founding, soon. So uh, I will put oh, the yeah. uh, to ask him. him. Yeah, and ask him what was going on in the Civil War in Minnesota and uh, the Southwest, you know, with the, uh, with the war against the Dakotas and the hanging, mass hanging and the uh, Sand Creek Massacre and the long walk of the uh, incarceration of the Navajos. Um, what does that have to do with it? You know, how did Lincoln take time for all of those still fighting Indians, you know, during, so that's not included, you know, in civil uh, texts on the Civil War. And I really, I think it's because historians can't, because the, the basic um, framework of doing U.S. history is almost like it's it's written in stone and you can only you know a few rocks fall off the stone and you kind of rearrange them and as civil rights comes up you've got to lift up and look underneath but it it doesn't include genocide it doesn't include you know ethnic cleansing genocide how the land was taken, how it got transferred from 500 nations in the continent to white people, basically Europeans own most of the land still today is in the hands of descendants of the original settlers. So, uh, and, and a whole government built around that but, you know, back to a nation of immigrants, I think one of the reasons I wanted to write this book and, and uh, break that down and demystify it is because it's one of the main modern, uh, you know, post-World War II um, curtains that have been created to camouflage the history of settler colonialism and genocide. And you know, it's not old. John F. Kennedy created that term, a nation of immigrants. He published a book in 1958 when he was Senator. And I'm pretty sure it was um, a kind of propaganda book for him running as a Catholic and a, a son of immigrants. Mm -hmm. Because up to that time, every single president had been either an original settler or a descendant of original settlers, either Almost Anglo or all, Scots. Or basically all British uh, Protestant descent. A Anglo, yeah, Scots Anglo, Scots Irish, or, um, uh, you know, the colonizers of, of Ulster, or Anglo, mm -hmm. or Anglo Scots or Anglo Brits. And, um, up until uh, John F. Kennedy ran. So I think he was trying to uh, show that immigrants were good. And it's mostly about our, you know, the Irish famine uh, refugees and, and immigrants. Uh, it doesn't include, um, never mentions the border or Mexico, which, you know, you, th you would think a, a book on. At that time, 
Operation Wetback was going on, which he had to vote for in Congress, you know, the, the deportation Forci of two million forcibly removing Mexican, Mexican workers. Mexico. Yeah. All right. So I think that it was created and it was picked up, you know, and, and then it made its way into textbooks and all. And now it's just, uh, you know, it is literally the world slogan for the United States uh, is that's the nation of immigrants. And it's a big lie that, you know, does make people want to come to the United States. Oh, there's a place where I can be totally accepted. You know, people who are, um, uh, but I think most people have come as immigrants uh, for jobs because it's an economic powerhouse. And you're, I'm sure that that was true of, of uh, your ancestors who came, the Eastern yeah, Europeans. They, they were, they were running, away, running away from, from the Tsar. Who, uh... from po yeah, from pogroms. And yeah, exactly. a, lot of the a lot of the Germans who came were socialists who were running away from persecution as, as socialists. And that's why we had a, a moment of uh, socialist organizing in the late 19th century, even where I came from in Oklahoma, it was mainly German socialist immigrants. Oh, I didn't realize that. Organizing. I mean, my grandfather was involved. He was just an old Scots-Irish settler guy. But uh, they were mostly German, uh, German socialists, many of them Catholic, Catholic too. Yeah, so immigrants have come for various, you know, political reasons, but also um, uh, fleeing just poverty, like the Sicilians who came, the Southern Europeans, tenant farmers, starving, needing remittances to send back to their families, you know, basically to work. And, but the whole idea that it's a beacon, you know, and the Statue of Liberty and all that, um, it's been very cruel, very cruel to, you know, I, I mentioned the exclusion of Chinese. The second uh, immigration law was to extend that to all Asians, all Asians. And the third In big one was- 1917, is that right? Uh, or some, yeah. some time and then, yeah, 1917. And, and, then, and then 1923, only Western Europeans and, strict quotas on everyone else. And one of the outcomes of that, tragic outcomes, and I think the United States is responsible for a lot of deaths of uh, Jewish uh, ref you know, refugees trying to escape. The United States had a strict quota on Eastern Europeans and could only take, they took less, they took fewer Jewish refugees than Cuba and Mexico, poor countries. Wow. Uh, yes. So that, that was a, and, and they also picked and chose, you know, intellectuals and nuclear scientists <laughs> uh, who they would, you know, who they would bring, not the poor suffering masses, you know, but uh, so that was, that, you know, it has consequences, it has tragic consequences, this, this exclusion. Roxanne, you, you've been campaigning for the truth and for advocacy of expanding uh, the, the understanding and the narrative of America for, for a long time. Uh, are, and now we're in the midst of uh, the history wars, uh, which are extraordinary. Uh, but showing how touching on these issues is uh, so fraught with the uh, with political division. Uh, even uh, Mitch McConnell, one of my least favorite uh, politicians in the world, writing uh, to uh, the Secretary of Education, "Don't teach this stuff. It uh, uh, it uh, divides us. Uh, as if uh, the truth uh, should be suppressed, so that the." Uh, white settler slave owning narrative uh, would be the only truth uh, that uh, was told in America. Has history is, is are we making progress? Uh, you've been watching this for a long time uh, and, and leading. Is there a change as America itself changes demographically as we have voices coming from indigenous historians, uh, of course, uh, uh, African-American historians telling the history 
from the perspective of those who suffered this fate? Yeah, I think I think that definitely um, uh, the horse is out of the gate uh, for truth. That it can't be it can't be stuffed back in. You know, it it just um, it's out there, and I I credit the civil rights movement, and you know that of course it started a long time ago with early in the in the 20th century, but really picked up after World War II. And then that spawned, uh, you know, the, the Red Power Movement, the um, Chicano, Mexican, Puerto Rican, um, women, women's liberation, LBGTQ and trans, um, that liberation is uh, very, very hard to it would take, uh, it would take very strong repression that the United States is not prepared for. They've mainly used um, drugs, um, sex and rock and roll and, you know, diversions, uh, films and all, to keep us all pacified. And, and, uh, and mass incarceration. And, then, and if you rebel, mass incarceration, you know. <laughs> and, um, and and other, you know, and actual sometimes uh, uh, killing people. Uh, so it, that has worked pretty well for a long time. But I think I think they they really don't know what who they're dealing with. Um, even in very uh, remote places, uh, people like me, you probably also. Uh, hear from people in small towns in rural areas and parts of the country. Everywhere you go, there is at least five or six people, if not a dozen or two dozen, who are dissidents to this right wing stuff that's all around them. And they're fighting it in various ways. And so it's, um, I think the pandemic, I, I've gotten a little pessimistic because I get my I recharge going out and talking in places like this and realizing they're there, but it's hard when you're just watching the screen and reading the news feeds uh, to see what's really out there, what's going on. Because I, I think, you know, truth and beauty and, uh, uh, looking to the future as being better is is something addictive, you know, in a good way that that is hard to suppress, especially in young people, because mm -hmm. they want to see a future and they don't want to see armed goons of spouting racist things on Capitol steps everywhere or in the nation's capital. That's not the future they want to see. And so I do think that uh, I say, bring it on, you know, this attack on history, because this is our opening to tell <laughs> the real story, you know, critical, uh, critical race theory was a very obscure thing. And so they <laughs> brought it up, and now up. everyone wants. Everyone's buying all these books and wanting to learn. <laughs> well, you you have uh, launched a critical imperial theory or critical colonial theory uh, with with this book. And Roxanne, I was I was really floored by the the last uh, sentence of the book. It's uh, not a spoiler alert because I want everyone to read all the richness uh, that that comes up to this, but. For me, I, I watch foreign policy a lot. I watch the United States from outside the United States a lot. It's stunning to me how militarized American foreign policy is on almost anything. The first resort is a military resort. If you can't do a military resort, just crush them with sanctions, but crush them. Be sure to crush them. Uh, so this is uh, how our foreign policy works. And I just want to read the, the last sentence of the book, which is, Fantastic. It says the United States will not decolonize until it is forced to do so. And unless colonization and imperialism are understood to be inherent in the very founding 
and all US institutions, we cannot begin to dismantle the fiscal military state. And this is really makes clear we're not arguing about the truth of history. We're arguing about the nature of America here. Uh, and you're right. talking about how to make a country that is uh, not obsessed with conquest. Uh, because after a long time, uh, after, as you say, a country that has been in a conflict every day since its founding, uh, this is uh, the, certainly the tonic that we need. Yes, and you know, I, I know you do a lot of work on, on China uh, and, and the ridiculous war, war making that the US is. I'm just, I'm just so afraid this pulling out from Afghanistan is, is what they're saying it is, you know, uh, we have to pay attention to China, they say the same thing Obama said we had to pivot to China. Yeah. And, you know, this is one of the most important chapters. In you might the world, think it could be a pivot to peace, right? But no, right. it could be a pivot to the but, next conflict. But the yellow peril thing goes back to Marco Polo saying, you know, those people are really organized. There's so many of them. They're going, they have roads and everything. They could take us over. They can overwhelm us. They get, there's been this paranoia and then it got named in the 19th century as the yellow peril that we have to be afraid of. And the whole trade union movement in the United States was corrupted by anti-Chinese uh, bigotry. Uh, Jack London and you know famous people, absolute bigots. And so I think we have to really, really support our um, you know our Chinese. Uh, American scholars and activists who are doing amazing work. A new book out by Mag Nagy, uh, NGAI, uh, is a very important book. Uh, Viet uh, Nguyen's books, of course, Nothing Ever Dies, a Vietnamese writer and his wonderful novels. Everyone should be reading this stuff and understanding uh, that we must stop this uh, war making, take those warships out of the South China Sea. Roxanne, that is a wonderful place for us to end a fantastic uh, discussion. But let me say thank you for helping shine the light on historical truth to uh, help us to understand our, our predicament today, and especially a kind of national addiction to uh, militarism. But as you say in the history, uh, we were founded as a fiscal military state, and it's quite an eye-opening uh, notion and idea and an extraordinarily powerful book. Uh, so uh, let me, uh, again, uh, please uh, encourage everybody listening uh, to read uh, Roxanne Dunbar Ortiz's uh, wonderful new study, Not a Nation of Immigrants. So powerful. Thank you so much for being uh, together in conversation with me today. I'm always so delighted to speak with you and so honored uh, to uh, speak with you. Next uh, uh, month, uh, we will continue on uh, related themes uh, on Monday, September 13 uh, at 11 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time. We'll have my wonderful dear colleague, uh, Professor Eric Foner of Columbia University, talking about his uh, fantastic new book, The Second Founding. So please join us uh, in a month. Thank you again for everybody being uh, together and please stay safe, stay well, and we'll be together with you next month, September 13th, 11 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff.